Hello. Uh, I'm going to be talking about why we can't describe our conscious experiences. Um, this is work with my co-author Shu, uh, my supervisor Yashua, and plenty of other people as well. Um, so, I mean, probably everyone in this room has thought about this sort of thing, but you know, try describing the experience of red really what it's like to see red and, and you quickly realize that uh, it's an impossible task. You know, I could describe it to you. I could just say, oh, I'm seeing red and then you know what I'm talking about or most people do, but it's sort of not describing it in an absolute sense where say somebody who's blind would have any idea of what I'm talking about. Um, so yeah, explaining this through a simple physicalist framework is the, the goal of this talk. Um, why I think this is important is because it's really addressing a part of the hard problem. If you think about the hard problem, the reason that it's so enticing is really just an accumulation of different thought experiments, all of which are, are really persuasive. Uh, and the thought experiment that ineffability relates to most, I think, is the knowledge argument. Um, so people probably already familiar with this. It's an argument against physicalism, or at least a point to a problem in physicalism, some explanatory gap. Um, but just to go over it again, so that you see, I guess, the way that I'm thinking about the, the knowledge argument. Um, it starts out with uh, Mary, who's grown up in a, in a black and white room. She's never seen any color, but she's, she's kind of the super scientist who knows all, all the physical facts that there are to know about color perception. She knows all the physics. She knows all the neuroscience. Uh, she, she kind of is like a superhuman as well, maybe infinite memory. Um, you, you, try and, you try and give her all the knowledge she could possibly have about the world to, to you know, know any other physical facts. Uh, and then you could still ask, does she learn something new when she steps out of the room and, and sees color for the first time? And pretty much everyone's intuition here is, is yes, she does learn something new. Uh, therefore, the conclusion, in my view, uh, that the knowledge argument tries to push forward is that if she still learns something, even though she knew everything, well, that, that means what she learns sort of isn't information, in a sense. Uh, and if it's not information, well, then how could it be consistent with, with uh, physicalism? Um, so, if, if you don't want to reject uh, physicalism so easily and kind of want to push back against the knowledge argument, um, the challenge becomes maybe to, to give a physicalist explanation of ineffability, of this fact that, you know, why wasn't she able to read something in her, her vast library of books that let her understand color perception in a way where, where she didn't learn anything when she stepped outside the room. Uh, and I think this is, this is possible. Uh, and sort of to give a sketch of what the argument is going to be, uh, breaks down into a couple steps. Why are conscious experiences rich? Simple answer, uh, they have high information contents. They're not these simple things. There's a lot that you would need to describe. Uh, and then why are they ineffable? Why can't we convey that information? Well, it's just there's significant information loss anytime we try uh, in language or as well through, through just neural, neural dynamics, there's constantly information loss that's making it such that the experience that you had is inaccessible at a later moment or when you try and describe it. Uh, at the same time, there's another sort of element of this, this paradox of, you know, how could they be ineffable, but at the same time communicable? You know, I could speak to somebody who, who has seen the color red and, and just identify it with that label or tell them something like it's a warm color and then they know what I'm talking about. So there's this communicability aspect, but also the ineffability one and, uh, I think we, we want to square both. And the idea is that I'm, I'm going to be talking a lot about uh, attractor dynamics and, and basins of attraction. Uh, and the point is that language is actually really good for not describing the position of an attractor, so the actual representation, but it's good for labeling them because there's a shared discrete structure, uh, which I'll talk about. Uh, okay, so I first want to start with some background on uh, attractor dynamics and uh, how they're related to, to consciousness. Um, so, you know, imagine neuron one on one axis, neuron two on another, and then the other uh, 80 billion or so on, on other axes. Uh, the brain is, is a dynamical system. This is kind of tautological, it's obvious. Uh, but, you know, at any point you're in this one space, you're in this one neural pattern, and then it's evolving through time. Uh, 
And even though this is kind of obvious, the tools of dynamical systems have been very useful in cognitive science. Uh, and one of the kind of fundamental tools in uh, dynamical systems is the notion of attractors. Um, and to simplify things, I'm just going to be talking about fixed point attractors, so these single vector states. Um, all these are, are their regions in the dynamics where once you reach them, or once you even enter their basin of attraction, these regions that pull towards the attractor, well, then you stay there, uh, at least temporarily until the inputs change or some no noise nudges you out of the attractor. Um, so yeah, I already mentioned these attractors are associated with basins. Uh, most of the time when people talk about attractors, they're talking about it as a form of transient memory, uh, right? Once you stay there, you, you remain there. So, so people think this is involved in working memory, long-term memory. It's been used to model decision-making and just very relevant for higher level cognition. Uh, but a less noticed feature about attractors is that they, they're kind of special that they have this uh, dual discrete and continuous nature. Uh, what I mean by that is, is the attractors are mutually exclusive. These basins partition the state space into a finite number. Um, so the discrete component is simply, well, which attractor are you in? Are you in this one? Are you in that one? Are you in you know none? Uh, but the continuous components is actually, where is the attractor in the state space? So that's like this, this high dimensional vector. It's not a discrete thing. Um, and if you know something about like natural language processing in, in uh, machine learning, this is very similar to the idea of word embeddings where like the word ID is the discrete components and then the actual embedding is this continuous meaning uh, part of it. Right, so that's, that's gonna be very important for, for how we could jointly explain ineffability and communicability at the same time. Uh, why am I talking about attractors? How are they even relevant in consciousness? Uh, well, they're at least relevant for, for access, conscious, access consciousness. I think that's um, kind, of, kind of the default assumption that we should have. It's, it's sort of explicit in global workspace theory, which I would say is the leading theory of at least access consciousness. Um, and global workspace theory says that basically for, for, for something in the global workspace to be you know, broadcast to the other systems, it has to be amplified and sustained for a certain amount of time. Uh, I think uh, Dehane even gives like some amount of milliseconds that it needs to be, you know, sustained for uh, to be broadcast. That means that any, anything that, that access con your, your workspace uh, influences has to have started in some attractor state, right? So that's, that's the relevance. Because again, maybe, maybe you don't think that uh, attractors are relevant for phenomenal consciousness, but at least the, the access part, they do seem to be. Uh, a bit more evidence, so uh, there's kind of this, we transition from these, this metastable sequence of one thought to another, and then the next, and then the next. Uh, there's also examples of like the Necker cube, where you might have one interpretation and then another. Clearly a very intuitive way to think about this is you were in one attractor, one way that we were representing the cube, and then very quickly you, some noise nudged you out of there, and then you, you went to the other one. Um, we also have evidence that neural representations are more stable in conditions like psychophysics conditions where subjects report being aware. So that stability is relevant to attractors and also that uh, these neural representations are more robust. So you consistently enter the same representation more often in aware conditions uh, due to this like digital, uh, digital style error correction of, of the discrete part of the attractor, right? It always fixes you back to the fixed point. Um, so hopefully I've kind of done a good enough job explaining what attractors are for, for people who aren't already aware and, and a bit about why they're uh, relevant to consciousness. Uh, now I want to talk about how I'm going to be uh, formalizing information. I'm not going to be using Shannon like in the previous talk. Uh, I think Komogorov gives us, Komogorov complexity gives us a bit extra over here. Uh, and then the good thing is that if you're not familiar with Kolmogorov complexity, it's super intuitive. So you denote the Kolmogorov complexity of some object X by K of X. Uh, and all it is, is it's, it's a number that tells you how long would the shortest program be in some programming language uh, that generates X. So this is deeply related to ideas of compression, right? Some, some object could be very large just when you look at it, but if it has a lot of structure in it, uh, then it's going to have low Kolmogorov complexity because you could write a short program that outputs that object. Uh, some quick examples over here. You know, these are 
obviously very short objects, but if the object was one, zero, one, well, it doesn't seem to be much structure. You kind of just have to hard code it. Um, if it's something like a larger object, let's say it's more high dimensional and it still doesn't have any noticeable structure, it's just strictly as higher Kolmogorov complexity. But here's another example of an object that has the same length as the previous one. And uh, clearly it is, it is much lower Kolmogorov complexity, right? You could write this short program. It's just a loop, it takes very few lines uh, that would output this, this object. So that's how it relates to ideas of compression. Um, and what I'm gonna say is that, that you could think about like this information quantity as the, the richness of, of an object. Um, there's also this notion of conditional Kolmogorov complexity, equally simple. So we're still talking about how many bits it takes to compress some object X. Uh, to out we have to write a program that outputs it, but now we're allowing our program to take Y as input. Um, so for instance, if X and Y are identical, you know, no matter how big X is, it's, it's conditional Kolmogorov complexity would be very small. You just, your program just outputs Y basically. Um, if they're very similar, then you just need to change a couple bits. Well, well this also helps you reduce the conditional Kolmogorov complexity. Uh, and if the two objects are just totally unrelated, well, then the program that outputs X is not even going to use Y. So we're just really talking about the Kolmogorov complexity of X. Y doesn't help compress you. Y doesn't help you compress X at all in that case. Uh, and a very natural kind of way to think about conditional Kolmogorov complexity is that it's ineffability. Right? It's the remaining information in X that's unaccounted for by some description of it Y. Right? Um, so that's, that's just a summary of what I've already said. I'm going to be talking about richness as the Kolmogorov complexity of some objects. Let's say that we're talking about experiences and you know, I don't know what mathematical structure one uses to represent experience. I don't think anyone knows. But say it's some mathematical structure. Uh, say it is some information. Well we could just talk about what's the length of the shortest program that outputs uh, the information corresponding to that experience. Um, if you think that the experience is basically something like a vector, um, then it's roughly equivalent to the dimensionality of that vector, right? Minus some additional structure or patterns that could exist in it. But let's say it scales roughly with the dimensionality of the vector. Um, so right away, you can see that, you know, the brain is really high dimensional, right? If you think that it's the firing rate of neurons, I think we have something like 80 billion of them. So you're talking about a massive vector over here. Clearly neural representations, maybe you think that only some parts of those neural representations are relevant to consciousness, still gonna be extremely high dimensional, still gonna be extremely rich. Although I know we have a discussion section on that in one of the rooms later and maybe people disagree. Uh, and then ineffability, again, it's uh, the complexity of, of the experience given some, some description. And I'll be considering many different parts of uh, many different uh, notions of what Y could be, so different sources of ineffability. Uh, but the standard one is verbal report. So I'm gonna argue basically if Y is something like, you know, an English language sentence, uh, you're not compressing the experience at all, or it really it still has massive complexity that's left undescribed by Y. All right, so let's get into a couple sources of ineffability. Let me just move this over here. Uh, so I'm going to have these little diagrams to talk about the different variables involved. Uh, in this case, you can think of like whenever I write phi, this would be the parameters of someone's brain. Maybe that's all their synapses. Maybe there's something extra also. Uh, but yeah, all, all the parameters that describe the dynamics of this person's brain. Um, the variable x is going to denote some neural trajectory over here. So like a sequence of these high dimensional patterns of neural activity. Uh, those, those typically always lead to attractors at some point. So I'm going to denote those with A. This is a vector state. And then also maybe from these trajectories of neural activity, there's some kind of function, which we don't know what it is. It's going to depend on what theory of consciousness you believe in, or maybe you want to stay agnostic. But there's some function that leads from these neural trajectories to some mathematical structure that, that just is conscious experience. And, and I'll stay completely agnostic as to, to what that is. Um, but given that, that neural dynamics have follow, follow attractor dynamics so that they converge to attractors, uh, this is one huge source of ineffability, right? Like uh, many trajectories always lead to the same uh, attractor. There's like an infinite number of trajectories that lead to the same one. So just from this many to one mapping, you, you can never recover the neural trajectory from the attractor alone. There's a lot of information there that was left out. So the complexity, even if I knew the parameters of somebody's brain, is, is 
quite large. There's significant information loss over here going from X to A, going from a trajectory to an attractor. Um, why this, this matters? Well, for instance, in global workspace theory, um, it's hypothesized that the sustained activity, basically the attractor, is the only thing that affects the other modules. It's the only thing that gets written to long-term memory. It's the only thing that affects motor actions. It's the only thing that affects what you're able to talk about. So the attractor kind of bottlenecks, you know, the amount of information that's that's that you could recover about the original experience. And this kind of captures why it's difficult to to catch yourself in a thought. The thought that I was having just a second ago, was it verbal? Was it pre-verbal? How much imagery did it have? We never really know. You know, maybe an explanation for that is that only the attractor is getting written to to uh, long term memory, and then when I try and recover it afterwards, you know, everything about the trajectory that that uh, which trajectory that I come from, uh, all that is lost. Now, moving on to to verbal reports again, if you believe something like global workspace theory, well, then the attractor bottlenecks what could actually go to language systems, what we could actually talk about. Uh, so there's this further downstream information loss. Uh, now, you know, the Kolmogorov complexity of an experience given the message M, given given some, some sentence that I might use to describe my experience, is going to be much bigger than given the, the uh, attractor because of similar kinds of arguments. You know, one M is, is this discrete low bit symbolic variable. There's not a lot of information in just language itself. Uh, at least compared to to the attractor, which is this really high dimensional snapshot of uh, neural activity. So there has to be some information loss over here. And then similar arguments where uh, A to M is, is many to one. Uh, you know, I might describe some experiences. I saw a fat cat. I'm obviously leaving out details that I, I was aware of and that I remember like, you know, what color it was. Um, here I want to flag this kind of Maybe you see it as a contradiction, maybe you don't, but if language is so coarse and simple, why could it describe experiences at all? And this also helps if you consider the attractor dynamics picture, uh, because the attractor, remember, it has this discrete part to it of, you could label which attractor I'm in, right? Maybe I could assign some, some, uh, some linguistic sentences to do that. And in fact, the attractors might have compositional structure such that I could label an attractor that I've, I've never been in uh, and, and uh, the, the label is still valid in a sense. It still identifies the correct attractor, right? So M, you can think of it as it could be used to index or identify the attractor. Um, it doesn't describe the continuous parts, uh, but as long as I have the, the parameters of someone's brain, I could probably decode from the message and recover the attractor or a small set of them. So the information loss is not just, it's not, it's not immense, basically. As long as you have the parameters, though. What changes over here is if I consider the Kolmogorov complexity of an experience given the message without the parameters, just, just knowing the label red the program that goes from that label to outputting whatever mathematical structure corresponds to the experience of red, it's the same length as if the label wasn't there, right? The label is this arbitrary label that doesn't help. It only helps if you have this, the parameters of someone's brain as well, who's had that experience kind of like where you could index the lookup table. So that's the only time that, that uh, language is useful for identifying experiences to people who've, who've already had them because of this discrete structure that uh, attractors have. Um, I don't know how much time I have left, uh, but you know, I, I basically just want to say a couple things about uh, interpersonal communication uh, as well. So, sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so this is uh, I'm going to be making similar noises over here to to Keenan, uh, but you know, I, I just consider a couple uh, examples of which Mary is just just one. Uh, Imagine that I'm trying to communicate to someone, Bob, and uh, blind is, is Bob. So Bob sort of has a brain where it's impossible for Bob to have an attractor for, for red. They, they don't have any, any color experiences. Um, the Kolmogorov complexity, uh, given Bob's parameters uh, and the message, so Bob's parameters are, are denoted by this tilde over here, that's Bob's brain. Um, this is significant because essentially what the program would have to do is, is look at, at phi tilde, look at Bob's brain, and then do some brain surgery on it such that color perception is restored just, just for the attractor 
corresponding to an experience like red to exist, right? So what is the information involved in that precise neural surgery that would have to be done? That's kind of what the ineffability is. Uh, Mary is a less extreme case, actually. So Mary, her color perception works just fine. She has that attractor in her brain somewhere. She just doesn't have a label that lets her kind of trigger, trigger her brain, kind of cue her brain to enter into that attractor. Right, so the Kolmogorov complexity in Mary's case is what information would I need to provide? Mary would have to read something that is knowledge about how to drive her brain into a state where it reaches that attractor. The easiest way to do that is just to, you know, encode the information that is, you know, some pattern of lights that involves this this particular wavelength, and then her brain would enter red right away and uh, all, all would be good. If she's just reading books, then it's a bit more complicated, but you know, um, uh, that, that's sort of how I think about the Mary case. Um, a less extreme case than, than that even, if, if it's just an unword, unknown word or language, um, then the problem is that there's no association between the attractor and the symbol that's being used. There's basically no ineffability over here, right? If somebody speaks German and I only speak English, uh, well, then I just have to change the, the message, right? There's very few, few bits associated to that change. And then ideal communication is that their brains are very similar. Um, the last thing that I, I would talk about is, is the grounding problem where people's brains are similar, but not exactly the same. They're slightly different experiences. Uh, but uh, yeah, maybe maybe uh, don't need to go into that, that too much. It's just a less extreme case of ineffability. Uh, so to conclude, uh, you know, I've pretty much already said this, uh, but, but just to sum it all up, conscious experiences are describable in principle, that's the argument here, uh, and so their contents consist entirely of physically embodied information, no philosophical problem. In practice, though, describing conscious experiences with language alone is too difficult. Language is good at referencing experiences, but bad at describing their contents, and we just feel like there's a philosophical problem because we don't encounter this ineffability in, in any other area of knowledge that we have, right? Something about science, I'm like, sure, I could encode that in, in language, no problem. Uh, but experiences are much more complex. They're much more information rich than any theory that we might have in sciences, which are specifically described to be, uh, specifically designed to be simple, right? That's, that's what it means to explain something in science, come up with a simple explanation. But there's no reason to think that conscious experiences need to be simple and describable in that same way. In fact, you know, it seems very reasonable to think that if they're they're high dimensional patterns of neural activity, that they are complex, that they have high Kolmogorov complexity. Uh, that being said, with a good decoder, so meaning knowing somebody's brain, uh, knowing the parameters of somebody's brain who's had that experiences, uh, that experience, then there's no ineffability there because the Kolmogorov complexity is low. I just need to use language to label the attractor and then they go into that state. No problem. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you.